Almighty God, I ask that you anoint me. Remove me from all fears and anxieties that I may have. Replace it with the movement of your spirit. And I ask, oh God, that you anoint the ears of those who would hear a message today, that the message they hear not be something that comes strictly from my mouth, but comes from you. Anoint their ears that they would hear the message you would have them on their faith journey today. Amen. Well, in reading and studying the scriptures for this Sunday's readings, I know that most pastors always stick with the Gospels to preach on. But all the research I could find was to tell you about what the custom dress was at the time. And that was very boring because they did not have a sense of fashion. It was just dull. So I'm not even going to bother going there. I want to talk to you about the goal of history. This morning I wish to reflect on Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. For God has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of God's will, according to God's purpose set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven, and things on earth. After that long introduction in that first le in that letter to the Ephesian of how Paul talks about being a servant of God and on and on and on, after that 20-minute diatribe, he finally gets to the point of what he's talking about and comes to grips with the subject that he's there to speak about. He says, as the authorized version has, has it, that God has made known to us the mystery of God's will. The New Testament uses the word mystery in a special sense. It is not something mysterious in the sense that it is hard to understand. It is something which has long been kept secret and has now been revealed. But it is still incomprehensible to the person who has not been initiated into its meaning. Let's take for an example. Suppose that someone comes to Spirit of Peace or any other church and they know nothing about Christianity and they attend the very first communion service. To that person it would be a complete mystery. They would not understand in the least what was going on. But to a person who knows the story and the meaning of the Last Supper, the whole service has a meaning which is quite clear. So in the New Testament, the sense of mystery is something which is hidden to the non-believer, but clear to the believer. For what then was Paul was the mystery of the will of God. It was that the gospel was open to the Gentiles too. In Jesus, God has revealed that God's love and care, God's grace and mercy, are meant not only for the Jews, but for the entire world. Now Paul, in one sentence, drops his great thought. Up till now, people have been divided. People have been living in a divided world. There was division between the beasts and the people. There was division between the Jew and the Gentile, the Greek and the barbarian. There were just divisions throughout life. Sounds like 2018 to me. All over the world there was strife and tension. Jesus came into the world to wipe out the divisions. That, for Paul, was the secret of God. It was God's purpose that all the many different strands and all the warring elements in this world should be gathered into one in Jesus Christ. Here we have another tremendous thought. 
Paul says that all history has been working out this process. He says that throughout the ages, there has been an arranging of an administering of things that this day of unity should come. The word Paul uses for this preparation is intensely interesting. It is oikonomia, which literally means household management. This was a steward of who saw to the, who saw to it that the family affairs ran smoothly. Your family CEO, if you will. It is the Christian conviction that history is the working out of the will of God. That is by no means what every historian or great thinker has been able to see. G. N. Clark, in his inaugural lecture at Cambridge, said, There is no secret and no plan in history to be discovered. I do not believe any future consummation could make sense of all the irrationalities of preceding days and ages if it could not explain them, still less could it justify. H.A.L. Fisher writes, one intellectual excitement, however, has been denied to me. Men wiser and more learned than I have discovered in history a plot, a rhythm, a predetermined pattern. These harmonies are concealed from me. I can see only one emergency following another as wave follows upon wave. Only one great fact with respect to which, since it is unique, there can be no generalization on the one safe rule for the historian, that he should recognize that the development of human destinies, the play of the contingent and the unforeseen. It so happens that we are living in, the, in an age in which people have lost their faith in any purpose for this world. But it is the faith of the Christian that in this world, God's purpose is being worked out. And it is the conviction of Paul that that purpose is that one day all things and all people should be one human family. As Paul sees it, that mystery was not even grasped until Jesus Christ came. And now is the great task of the church to work out God's purpose of unity revealed in Jesus Christ. We may see in our world nothing but greed, evil, turmoil, and persecution. We, as the heirs and children of Christ, must never lose hope or strength and bring this all together. We must busy ourselves now more than ever before to bring unity and a Christ-centered peace to the world around us. All of these things have happened in the past and all these things continue to happen now. We cannot answer for them. We cannot justify them. What we can do is to bring Christ into the center of it all. And that's what we're called to do. We can look at the greed and the corruption that goes on in our country and our government. We can look at the hatred and the bigotry and the racism that goes on in our streets and our cities. We do not have to answer for it. We do not have to justify it. What we have to do is stop and look at each person in the eyes and say, the revelation's already come true. You are the body of Christ. And help lift them up. Lift ourselves up. That's what we are supposed to be doing. That's what we're called for.
Paul, who really, as I said last week, was somewhat of a lunatic, who to this day is still hated by a lot of people, at least got it right. Paul wasn't there to try and justify anything that had already happened. Paul was there to come to the realization and to the awakening that Jesus Christ was alive and well for all people, for the Gentile as well as the Jew, the free as well as the enslaved, the rich as well as the poor, the black as well as the white, the male as much as the female. Christ Jesus is there for everybody. And in these times of turmoil and grief and strife, we can't forget that. When you go about your daily work, your daily task, when you go about trying to have just a little bit of fun, it's Christ who brought you to the revelation that you are part of the family of Christ. And no one can take that away from you. And the really fun thing about it is you've been given the privilege to share that gift with each and every person that you come into contact with. That's my prayer for you this week. Amen. Yeah. <laughs>